the, the meeting. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, the first World Interactive Webinar uh, between the Nephrology and the Diabetology Division at uh, Mansoura University. Um, our um, webinar topic today is diabetic bone disease. Diabetes is very uh, prevalent um, disorder. And also bone disease is, is very frequent, but sometimes it's unseen and it's hidden and usually present late with fractures. Um, today, our meeting is a uh, two hours uh, meeting. We have great uh, uh, contribution from both the nephrology and uh, the diabetology division at Mansoura, and also uh, from um, um, uh, Emirates. We have the chair uh, person, Dr. Um, uh, Tarek Gouda and uh, Dr. Ella Sabri. We have three moderators. Um, we have our professor, Dr. Hanan Gawish, and uh, professor, Dr. Mohamed Yaoud, uh, along with myself. Uh, we have great speakers, uh, Dr. Uh, Amani Musa from the um, Division of Endocrinology at Mansoura University, and Dr. Asma Al Jabri. She is a consultant, uh, endocrinology consultant. Uh, at uh, Taiwan Hospital um, UAE. Uh, then we have two case presentation and discussion. The case presentation uh, will be uh, presented by Dr. Hanan, uh, by, sorry, Dr. Mohamed um, Rojdi and Dr. Mohamed Mamdouh. And we have quiz that will be presented by Dr. Hanan Abdelhai. And the answer and, national, and the rationale and justification of the questions will be discussed by Dr. Sally Sama. Here is the meeting agenda, as you can see. Uh, we'll uh, start with the quiz by Dr. Hanan Abdelhai. Then we'll have the first lecture by Dr. Asma El Jabri. She's going to focus on the introduction of the diabetic bone disease. She will give us uh, thoughtful information about the prevalence, epidemiology, pathogenesis, and diagnosis of diabetic bone disease. Uh, then we'll have the first case, will be presented by Dr. Uh, Mohamed Mamdouha Abdelbari. Uh, then we'll have the second lecture by Dr. Amani Musa about the management of diabetic bone disease. She will focus on both the pharmacological and the non-pharmacological intervention to prevent and to um, treat the bone loss in diabetic patients. Then we we'll have the second case presentation by Dr. Mohamed Rajdi. Then we'll end the meeting within two hours by giving a justification and the rationale for um, this quiz. I'm going to stop uh, my um, uh, sharing my um, screen and will allow um, Dr. Hanan Abdelhai to share her screen and to give us the quiz. By the way, there is a link. If you haven't done this yet, please join the link and try to answer the questions. So by the end of the meeting, we'll have scoring um, system uh, to see exactly um, how many of you got the right answer. And that's, of course, an educational question, not testing or anything. Uh, then we'll give you the best answer with the explanation of the right answer. Go ahead, please, Dr. Hanan. Dr. Hanan. Mamdouh, can you put the link again? Oh, yeah, Mamdouh already did. Thank you.
you have the link in the chat box. Are you with us, Dr. Hanan? Hanan Abdul Hai? Oh, you are muted, Doctor. Uh, yes. Muted. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Do you hear me now? Yes, we do. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Doctor Hanan Abdul Hai, lecturer of endocrinology and diabetes, Mansoura University. This quiz is about diabetic bone disease. It is totally formative, just to refresh your data about or your information about the bone diabetic bone disease. And we will start now. The first question. Regarding diabetes, uh, diabetic osteopathy, which of the following statement is true? Osteoplasts exposed to low blood sugar exhibit a, a reduced proliferation capacity, slow extracellular matrix senses, and subsequently slow maturation and mineralization. Option number two. Number two, the higher fracture risk described in type two diabetes, despite the elevated mean value of the bone mineral density and T-score, is due to an impaired bone quality. Recent study showed that C-terminal cross-link telopeptide and osteocalcin and also sclerosine level showed no significant change in diabetes with type 1 or in type 2 diabetes and normal population. It is believed that increase in bone mineral density in patients with type 1 diabetes is mostly associated with excess energy and being overweight and the adaptive changes in the bone to carry an increased body load can also can cause an increase in bone mineral density. The last option, a patient with either type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes have an, an normal bone microarchitecture. Next question, Mrs. R is 50 years old nurse with type 2 diabetes for six year duration, inquiring about increasing bone density, about decreasing bone density in diabetes. Regarding bone mineral density in diabetic patients, the following statement is true. First option, usually in the early stages of type 2 diabetes, the bone mineral density is reduced due to insulin resistance. Option number two, only postmenopausal women with type 1 diabetes have a lower bone mineral density than that of the normal population during the same period after adjustment of age and BMI. For patients with type 1 diabetes, absolute deficiency in insulin secretion cause significant sufficient bone mineralization in adolescence. Option uh, number four, follow-up of patients with type 2 diabetes proved that there is no correlation between serum IGF-1 levels and the bone mineral density. Patients with type 1 diabetes have normal cortical thickness and a normal cortical vertebral bone mineral density in comparison with the normal population. The next question, Mrs. A is a 60-year-old osteoprotic on aldronate 70 mg weekly and diabetic on oral treatment for the last three years. With acceptable range of control of diabetes, visited an oil oil outpatient clinic for follow up. What would your target? What would you what would your target of A1C would be in management of type two diabetes and patients at risk of fragility fracture in the light of this? Case? Higher A1C target above seven point five percent to avoid the risk of hypoglycemia. Strict A1C target less than six point five to reduce the risk. Of complications such as in neuropathy and retinopathy. Usually, A1C target at 7%. Individualized A1C target to balance the need for good glycemic control for reduction of diabetes type 2 complication and the risk of hypoglycemia on treatment between 6.5 or 7.5%. The next question Which of these anti osteoporotic drugs can be used? In the treatment of osteoporosis in suitable type 2 diabetic patient, bisphosphonate or denosumab, raloxifene, or teriparatide. The first option, there are no diabetic type 2 di specific approved drug for osteoporosis treatment. Only recommended calcium and vitamin D intake. Only denosumab is as it is safer in patients with renal impairment together with adequate calcium and vitamin D intake. Only teriparatide as it is an anabolic uh, agent so helps with bone formation together with adequate calcium and vitamin D intake. Other drugs beyond this list are more beneficial to diabetic patients. The last question, hyperglycemic control is the base of diabetic bone disease treatment. Regarding anti-diabetic treatment, uh, which of the following statement is correct? First option, CBB4 is increased in bone, uh, increase in bone marrow fat in type 2 diabetic patients. 
Can agliflozin resulted in significant increase in bone mineral density in the lumbar spine and the hip in patients with type 2 diabetes? Metformin was proved to increase all site fracture in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Cyazolidine dione caused an increase in the adipogenic differentiation of bone marrow mesenchymal stem cell and the inhibition of osteogenic differentiation. Insulin is known to decrease the, length, uh, the risk of fracture even with causing hypoglycemia. Thank you for listening wherever you are, wherever you are, what are you doing? So just stay focused and we may reach the answer. Thank you all. The link for this quiz would be applied as a Google form in the chat box to start your, uh, to can you, you can answer it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hanan, for uh, your quiz. So we have uh, uh, one hour, 45 minutes. So please try to have, uh, you know, get your answers. And probably most of uh, these questions will be answered throughout this meeting. Uh, so there is no rush, you still have time. Um, I have the pleasure today to introduce Dr. Asma Al-Jabri uh, to give um, our uh, first lecture in the meeting today. She will talk about introduction of diabetic bone disease. Dr. Asmael Jabri is a consultant endocrinologist in the Department of Medicine at Taiwan uh, Hospital. She is also adjunct assistant clinical professor at the College of Medicine and Health Science at UAEU uh, in Arab United Emirates, um, the main university there. She graduated from uh, the same university and she completed her residency at uh, Tawam Hospital, and she passed her Board of Internal Medicine in 2011. Um, she also completed uh, her fellowship in endocrinology at the Division of Diabetes and Endocrinology and Metabolism at uh, Vanderbilt University in uh, USA. At the same institution, she had clinical training in osteoporosis and bone metabolism and obtained the clinical uh, certification for the densitometrist, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, expertise. Her interests include osteoporosis, bone metabolism, obesity, lipid metabolism. She runs a metabolic bone disease clinic at her hospital. Um, I have interaction with her for the last uh, year and every single time, uh, she just uh, surprised me with her knowledge and experience in metabolic bone disease. Please go ahead, uh, Dr. Jabri, and start your lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amr, for the kind introduction. Uh, and I would like to thank in advance Dr. Mamdouh for sharing my slides that uh, currently I'm out of my work uh, place. Um, my topic today is going to be about diabetes bone health and what we need to know as nephrologists, diabetologists, endocrinologists, or orthopedists, uh, uh, those uh, physicians who are dealing on a daily basis with diabetic patients and fracture or bone health. To start with, I don't have any disclosure. My, my objectives for tonight is going to be understand the impact that diabetes has on bone health, describe fracture risk in patients with diabetes, review possible mechanisms for bone loss in diabetic patients, and assist fracture risk in diabetics. And finally, I would like to go through uh, some effect that skeletal may have on glucose uh, control. So as we're talking about diabetes and the bone, then we'll talk about bone and diabetes. We all know that diabetes is highly prevalent and uh, based on the uh, I, um, um, International Diabetes Federation, the latest statistics uh, in ATLAS was from two, 2021, that around 537 million are living with diabetes worldwide. And as you can see here that uh, in our area, we're having really a high number of patients with diabetes, 73 million people with diabetes in uh, MENA region. Next slide. So does diabetes enhance the risk of bone dysregulation and fracture risk? That's the question we all ask ourselves uh, uh, to start with, to understand the relation between diabetes and bone health. So we all know from what we're reading that there is a decreased bone turnover in diabetic patients. 
uh, it could be because of uh, glucosuria and decreased uh, urinary calcium through the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, losing it in the urine. Uh, the increased urine uh, uh, calcium is really the mechanism is not very well known, except that it could be due to glucose diuresis. And the other cause that might also affect the bone, the advanced glycation and the product accumulation in the collagen and uh, the cortical porosity in patients with diabetes and the vitamin D deficiency, especially in type two diabetes with obesity. We'll go into details more now to understand the mechanisms. And this is very basic stuff, uh, uh, trying to understand the correlation between bone formation and uh, bone resorption. Uh, we all know that the osteoplast is the, uh, the cell that are responsible for uh, bone formation and the osteoclast is the responsible for uh, bone resorption. So osteoplast producing the rankin ligand, rankin ligand is a uh, binding to rankin receptors on the uh, uh, osteoclast uh, cells and help in differentiation of the osteo pre osteoclast to osteoclast uh, cell and that will cause the bone resorption. At the same time, osteoplast is uh, um, producing OPG, which inhibit the, bind uh, the binding of uh, rankin ligand to rankin receptors and that would inhibit the uh, pro differentiation of uh, osteoclast activity, uh, osteoclast cells uh, and causing the osteoclast activity and would reduce the bone resorption. So it's so important to understand that there is a, a regulation between the uh, bone resorption and bone uh, formation. Uh, so whenever we have a decrease of EG, that will increase the receptor. And whenever we have more of the, um, the um, osteoclast activity will decrease. So what would happen in diabetic patients? Uh, there is a mechanism of induced osteoclastogenesis. And in diabetic patients, we know that hyperglycemia will make them more uh, susceptible to have inflammation and inflammation along with increase the uh, hyperglycemia, uh, it's gonna turn protein into what we call it uh, AG, AGs, which advance uh, glyc uh, glycation and the product will, would, what would precipitate in the collagen and would affect the collagen quality on those patients. And at the same time, diabetic have increased reactive oxygen species uh, and in the presence of lack of uh, insulin and insulin signalings, that would affect what I just talked about, the uh, homeostasis between the rankle ligand and OBG. So what would happen that would increase the osteoclast formation and increase the osteoclast activity and would increase uh, uh, as, uh, as a result uh, the uh, bone resorption. Next slide, please. What about reduced bone formation? It's also the same process that uh, increase uh, the glucose increase uh, inflammation, uh, increase formation of AGs, uh, increase uh, reactive oxygen species and lack of uh, insulin and insulin signaling would affect the osteoplast cells. And that would decrease very important markers in bone formation, BMP, uh, R RUNX2 and uh, FRA. And the reduction of these markers would increase the uh, apoptosis uh, of the uh, uh, osteoplastic cell and would decrease their pro proliferation and differentiation and would also affect the musculoskeletal cells and increase the adipogenesis in these cells, uh, would, would, which would lead to increase the uh, adipocytes and the uh, fat and increase the fat and the bone marrow and would, would affect the quality of bone uh, uh, of those patients and would decrease the, the quality uh, of bone and the bone formations. So as a result, that there would be a dysregulation between bone formation and bone resorption. And that with the greater risk of having other causes due to diabetes uh, complications like peripheral neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, and hypoglycemia, which would put the patients at a higher risk of falls, and as a, uh, as a result, those patients would have really very high risk of a fracture. Next slide, please. So after discussing this, the question, do diabetic patients fracture more often than those patients without diabetes? And I just uh, mentioned this, that those patients, especially there has 
there have been many studies done in this field to look at the patient with diabetes comparing to non-diabetic patients or to compare type 1 with type 2 or pre-diabetes. And those studies found that the type 2, for example, diabetic patients, they're having a higher BMD. But at the same time, they're having a very high uh, risk of a fracture. Um, and the fracture risk at any given T-score for diabetic patients is way higher than patients without diabetes. And we'll know in the next few slides. So this is an, a study done in 2019, uh, published in the World Journal of Diabetes. And as I mentioned, just showing you, they were studying uh, patients with insulin resistance, pre-diabetes and type two diabetes, and they found that the bone formation markers decreased on those patients, uh, P1MP, osteochrome, um, uh, osteocalcin, uh, uh, specific alkaline phosphatase, uh, and the OPG, they all uh, were uh, reduced. And at the same time, uh, bone resorption markers were higher uh, on those patients. The next slide. And at the same journal, they were looking at the risk of a fracture in type 1, type 2, and the prediabetes. And they found that the risk of fracture in type 1 patients is very high, three to six times uh, comparing to the normal population. Type 2 diabetic, diabetic it's 1.2 to 3% higher. And they looked also at the bone mineral density. Type 1 uh, has a low bone density, while type 2 and prediabetes, they're having a higher uh, BMD. The bone turnover reduced, but significantly reduced in type 2 uh, diabetes. Uh, they also looked at the bone uh, marrow adiposity, and they found that uh, patients with insulin resistance, they're having a high bone marrow adiposity. Uh, they looked at the AGs, uh, the bone matrix, and they found that in type 1 and type 2, the AG, AGs were high. Looking at the porosity and what we call the microarchitecture of the bone, they found the cortical porosity increased in type 1 and type 2, while in prediabetes there, uh, there was decrease in tra trabecular uh, and the cortical bone size. Next slide, please. And uh, looking at the fracture in type 1, they found that there is an increased risk of a fracture in type 1, which begins really very early on in life, and that's for all fracture types. And as you can see on the left graph, so the fracture risk in diabetic patients, also looking at the meta-analysis, and uh, this meta-analysis is showing that uh, patients with type 2, they're having a very high risk of a fracture. And if, when they looked specifically the type 2 diabetics, they're having a high risk of a fracture of the hip. And the longer the duration of diabetes, the uh, higher the risk of a fracture. And there was no um, really good evidence uh, for type 2 diabetes and risk of wrist, wrist spine or a foot fracture. Next slide, please. And when we're looking at the true a fracture and comparing to the risk of a fracture estimated uh, by um, either uh, um, DEXA scan or uh, FRAX. Uh, as you see on the left side is the true, uh, true fracture of the head and the uh, second one is the uh, fracture of the vertebrae and the, the estimated fracture uh, on the um, right side uh, is the estimation. The first on the right is by FRAX and the second one second to the right is by the uh, DEXA. And this is really uh, uh, shocking because the estimation is way less than the true risk of a fracture. For example, if we are looking at the DEXA, it's only showing, uh, it's only third of the real uh, risk of fracture on those patients. Next slide, please. And uh, this is another study also showing you that uh, patients with diabetes, they're having a very high risk of a fracture when they're having a poor uh, glucose control. And here, if you're looking at this, this is a 220,000 uh, patients from the Taiwan National Diabetes Case Management and uh, showing in the upper uh, uh, um, the the upper side of the uh, of the graph is showing that the higher hemoglobin A1C when it's more than ten, uh, they're having a higher risk, and the lower the dots when if the uh, um, hemoglobin A1C less than six, the lower risk of a fracture. Next slide. 
And uh, those patients with diabetes, uh, they're having a very high risk of falls, and that would attribute it to having a high risk of a fracture. For example, all these uh, systematic uh, review uh, and beta analysis is showing that uh, patients with diabetes, they're having very high risk. More than 60% of patients, they're having a risk of a fall. And when they looked at the treatment type, Di uh, insulin treatment and non-insulin treatment, patients on insulin treatment, they are having a high risk of uh, fall, 94% patients uh, with insulin treated, while 27% when they're non-insulin tre tre uh, treated. And that is giving you also an idea that if they reach the insulin uh, treatment stage, most likely they're having already established complication of diabetes like a neural, uh, neuropathy. Next slide. And uh, this slide is showing also uh, how the FRAX uh, as a tool is really underestimating the risk of a fracture in diabetic patients. And if you're looking at the upper part of the uh, graph, the uh, solid uh, dotted line, uh, patients with diabetes uh, on insulin, then patients in diabetic non with non-insulin, then the lower in the slides, uh, the, the uh, straight line is uh, uh, no diabetes. And we will say we can say that there is um, a separation of the line from the beginning of the graph, and uh, patients with diabetes significantly having a higher risk of uh, of a fracture comparing to non-diabetic, and that's really underestimated by the uh, the FRAX because FRAX is showing really very low risk of a fracture on those patients with, uh, with diabetes. Next slide. The question if the FRAX and DEXA is really underestimated the risk of a fracture, do we have uh, any strategies to bet better uh, predict uh, fracture on those patients with diabetes? Uh, that's a very important question, and we will uh, know it in the next slide. So um, um, there is a software called Trapecular Bone Score, and uh, this is a software which was, uh, which can be installed with the DEXA machines. Uh, it helps us to know the quality of the bone. Um, we know that there is many ways to know the quality. It's either to do uh, um, uh, HR, uh, um, high, high resolution CT for uh, those patients, or to do bone biopsy. But I mean, uh, the easiest non-invasive ways to know it is to use the TBS software. Uh, it's a bit expensive. Uh, it started to be now popular and used with uh, many institutions. Uh, our institution is really using TBS to assess the bone quality, uh, and we don't have an access to bone biopsy. So it's showing us the quality of the bone in those uh, diabetic patients, and we know that the patients with diabetes is having a lower um, um, the TBS. So we're using the TPS as a tool to modify the FRAX and to have a better uh, estimation uh, for the risk of diabetes. And then the next, next question, uh, can we use it for both with type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients? So far, uh, many studies have been done to assess the uh, accuracy uh, uh, of the um, FRAX um, uh, in patients with diabetes, uh, either type 1 and type 2. So no studies have directly evaluated the FRAX performance for type 1 uh, with the, uh, with the um, uh, uh, TBS, but uh, what we're using is really the... Um, if you're not going to use the, the DEXA scan, uh, the BMD as a, uh, a variable, you just can't take the osteoporosis as a secondary a secondary cause, but we don't really uh, um, adjust the FRAX for those patients. How about the type 2? Uh, the adjustment and modification of FRAX, usually we're using it with the type 2 patients. So you have four ways how to do it. It's either to um, uh, use the TBS uh, as an input to uh, uh, the, the FRAX or check the rheumatoid arthritis uh, as a yes on those patients or reduce the femoral neck T-score by 0.5 or add the age uh, input by 10 years extra. Next slide. Uh, there is another way also to look at the uh, bone quality on those patients by doing the bone biopsy. And uh, you can see here uh, the bone biopsy. Uh, the um, uh, graph on the um, left side is showing the normal um, um, uh, bone biopsy. And the on the left, uh, uh, the right side, sorry, uh, B is the uh, type 2 diabetic patients. And this, the fluorescent here, of, or you see the light in the, on the a, the control, this is the tetracycline uh, 
um, uh, what we use it uh, to lighten the and to give us indication about the bone formations. And uh, if you if you notice here in the type two di diabetes, we cannot see it. Um, this is lost. So on the left side, we're having less osteoplast activity. We're having less mineralization. We don't see the uh, tetracycline um, um, lightening here, uh, which indicating the bone formation. So. This is indicating that those patients is having really very low bone tear turnover. Next slide. And the final, this is uh, also a CT, uh, as I mentioned, to look at the bone quality on those patients. And if you look at the uh, left side, this is a, a type two diabetic patients with a fracture. For example, this is uh, on the right side is diabetic two patients without a fracture. And uh, if you look at the cortex of the bone, um, this is a rest um, um, bone. Uh, there, is, there is increase in the uh, porosity, cortical porosity on uh, those patients with a fracture. So this is indicating that the uh, um, high porosity on those patients is really uh, making them more susceptible to have a fracture. Next slide. So the final uh, thing that I just want to uh, mention a few things about the uh, the effect that skeleton might have in glucose control. And we know that the skeleton is really having a couple of types of hormones like uh, fibroblast growth factor 23, osteocalcin, and lipocalin. Uh, uh, FG23, we know that it's um, mainly responsible for uh, um, uh, phosphatiuria. And I will just mention here about a few things about osteocalcin. N next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, osteocalcin is very important uh, hormone, which is really help in uh, building the bone. So, it is carb the carboxylated uh, osteocalcin has an affinity to the bone matrix, uh, and when it get the acidic osteoclast environment, decarboxylate the uh, osteocalcin and release it uh, into the circulation, and that's help also in the uh, building of the bone. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the low osteocalcin activity, it is a predictive of type in, in, uh, in the patients with type 2. Uh, it's leading to a more risk of a fracture and uh, the cardiovascular disease on those patients. So um, really osteocalcin is playing an important role on, on those patients. And in this study, one study has been done um, a couple of years back at, uh, um, on rats. They found that when they infused the osteocalcin, they had really a very uh, low risk. Uh, they had a high insulin infusion, and they, they were thinking that uh, if there is any, um, I mean, in the future, um, any treatment of diabetes with the osteocalcin, because uh, the mice, when they uh, were injected with the osteocalcin, they had a very high, uh, good uh, insulin level. So while this, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. These are my references, and uh, um, we'll receive, have a question maybe at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mamdouh, for sharing my slide. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Al-Jabri, for this nice presentation. Uh, now the floor is open uh, for questions and discussion. Just have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Al-Jabri. Um, so I think the relationship between type 1 diabetes, uh, bone loss, and the risk of fracture is straightforward. But when it comes to type 2 diabetes, it's a little bit complicated because as you mentioned, the BMD might be normal or even higher compared to the general population. Um, my question for you, why not to use a uh, um, you know, correction factor? So instead of saying osteoporosis for the general population is a T-score of less than minus 2.5, why not to adjust this for type two diabetic patient and say, and instead of using minus 2.5, we can use minus 2.0 instead or something like that. Because I think most of the studies show the difference between 0 0.5, 0 0.6 with a higher BMD and type 2 diabetes. And also giving, uh, um, you know, the notion that type 2 diabetic patient is not one of the risk factors we use in the FRAX score. It's, you know, only type 1 is mentioned in FRAX, but type 2 is not. Um, can you please comment on that? 
I, I completely agree with you. And I think this is what they're doing with the FRAX 2. Um, FRAX 2 is coming. So uh, I'm not sure how they modified this because uh, with the FRAX 2, we don't need to do any modifications. So we, uh, we're going to get out of this hassle of either choosing the TBS adjusted FRAX or adding 0.5 or adding 10 years uh, or taking the rheumatoid. So with the FRAX2, it's going to be straightforward. Um, um, diabetes type 2 is, is going to be there, and we can take it as uh, and it's going to be a parameter which will calculate the uh, FRAX. So why we don't do it, I don't know why they never thought about it, why we, um, we're we not adjusting this um, from uh, to start. And I think it's also diff different because when we're looking at the BMD at the different population, each population is having different BMD comparing to other. So um, I think, for example, um, 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 people in the uh, um, uh, North America, they're having a high risk of uh, a fracture, but uh, we're here uh, um, in the um, main region and in the Gulf, we don't see that number of high uh, fracture as compared. So most likely the, uh, the BMD is really different uh, uh, between uh, different ethnicities. Very good, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, my second question for you, and uh, it will be also, I think, mentioned. Can can you deal uh, with this uh, a screen, Mamdou? See what's going on with the screen. Somebody is trying to control yeah. the screen. Um, yeah, my, thank you. My question for for you, Doctor Al Jabri, is as you mentioned in the bone histomorphometry studies for diabetic patient, it's much, much more common to see low bone turnover and adynamic bone disease in diabetic patient uh, compared to general population. But I'm still seeing most of endocrinologists and others, internal medicine, you know, and family medicine doctor, their first choice to treat bone loss and osteoporosis in diabetic patient is to use the anti-resorbative therapy, especially the alendronate and bisphosphonates in general. Can you please comment on that? Uh, again, again, what is, what is the question? So why, exactly? why, why are we using more anti-resorbative therapy if the main pathogenesis and the main mechanism of bone loss in diabetic vision is low rather than high turnover bone disease? Why we are not using osteoanabolics, okay. teribaratide, abarobaratide, or romosizumab, okay. rather than anti resorptive therapies. Okay, I mean, the studies really, no studies uh, have been done to um, specify which treatment is better to be started on diabetic patients. We know that the, uh, there is a low bone turnover on those patients, but uh, uh, for example, um, uh, bisphosphonate is the, the well-studied medication and all those uh, patients, regardless of diabetic and non-diabetic, and show that they're having a very good uh, bone uh, gain after starting the bisphosphonate. Uh, if we're talking about uh, other uh, medication, like uh, starting the uh, anabolic, uh, we know that uh, patients with diabetes, they're having a cortical porosity. And uh, if we're talking about teriparatide and patients uh, on apoloparatide, Apaloperitide and teriparatide is also increase the porosity, cortical porosity, and it might put the patients at increased risk of a fracture. Uh, so is it the best medication for those patients? We don't know. Then we will we, we'll be, we'll be left with only one medication, the, uh, the uh, romososoma. It's going to be the best to be uh, started on such patients. But again, we know that the um, starting the medication is really mm -hmm. based on the patient's risk of a fracture. So patients is having a high, very high risk of a fracture. Anabolic is going to be the first one. Patients with uh, lower risk of a fracture is going to be started on uh, what we call it only high risk. It's going to be started on bisphosphonate or uh, Very good, very good. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, explaining this. Um, and um, I think uh, if anyone has any question regarding uh, Dr. Al-Jabri lecture, uh, we can handle it to send it over to her and she, I think, will be happy to answer it. And I will let Dr. Ela Sabri to introduce Dr. Mamdouk for his case presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's really uh, my pleasure to see all of you here uh, in this fascinating event. Really, it's fascinating because it, it gathers 
uh, most of the eminent endocrinologists, diabetes, and nephrologists from the Arabic world and from the UC as well. Uh, it's my pleasure actually to present my colleague, uh, Dr. Mohammed Mandouh. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Mandouh is a lecturer of nephrology, <coughs> Mansoura, nephrology and biology, Mansoura School of Medicine, with special interest in uh, CKD, MBD. He has a very good uh, knowledge for us, and thanks to Professor Am in collaboration with uh, Intake Mineral Bone uh, Disease Unit. Uh, Mandouh actually gained a lot of experience and training with Professor Arm. Uh, Mandouh will present a, a very puzzling case of uh, chronic disease, mineral bone disorder, secondary to diabetes, and CKD as well. Uh, Mandouh, please present your slides. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Mandouh. He's gone. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I was busy like dealing with some underage. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So I'm presenting today a sixty year old Caucasian female. She is married with two offspring. She is non alcoholic. She was a smoker for 20 years, but she, she stopped smoking two years ago. Her monopause was at the age of 46. The patient. Uh, has diabetes type 2 for 15 years. She was on oral anti-diabetic medication, then shifted to insulin basal bolus regimen seven years ago. She has a positive history of diabetic neuropathy and retinopathy. She has also like a proteinuria in her urine analysis. So uh, she had also like diabetic nephropathy. The patient is hypertensive 16 years ago on lisinopril and amlodipine. Uh, she had. Uh, she is coronary artery disease with uh, BCI and stent five years ago, and she is now CKD stage three A with EUFR of fifty five. Her BMI is thirty five, and there is uh, no weighted changes have been observed in last years. The patient was referred to UK bone clinic after recently discovered that she had multiple vertebral fractures while doing a screening vertebral fracture assessment. This was not the first fracture. So seven years ago, the patient fractured her wrist and ribs while her foot slipped over the carpet. And back then, her lab were as following. So she had a normal calcium, normal phosphorus, normal IPTH. Vitamin D level as well uh, was normal. Alkaline phosphatase was a bit, was a bit high. Her serum creatinine back then was one milligram per deciliter, and the estimated EGFR of power was 65 back then, and her serum albumin was 30.9, uh, 3.9. So uh, she did a DEXA scan, which revealed that you can see here the uh, DEXA scan of the of the hip. So the lowest T score at the femoral neck was minus 1.9, and the average of femoral neck was minus uh, 1.35. And her head T score, the average was minus 0 0.85. So the lowest T score at the head was minus 1.9. So she was osteopenic by dexabimity. And the number is pine, the L1, L4 T score, uh, the, the average was 0 0.6, and the lowest was. Zero. So the patient is uh, osteopenic by DEXA BMD. Back then, her treating physician uh, told her that she has osteoporosis and she will need to take elemental calcium of uh, 1,200 milligram per day, vitamin D of 800 international unit, and she had to start an oral bisphosphonate, uh, which was alindronate 70 milligram per day. So our question is, do you agree with his diagnosis and the decision to start anti-osteoporotic medication and why? So you can enter your answer at the uh, chat box. So however, the patient is osteopenic by dexa BMD. So the diagnosis please is osteoporosis. Please summarize it again, Mamdouf, in, in a couple sentences, the presentation and the problem. So everyone will be focused how to answer the question, please. So uh, we have the patient with diabetes. Sorry? 
This is a question to the audience, or you will continue and answer the question as I'm. Yeah, I will continue. I will continue, but they can like see the uh, response of the audience, or you will continue your presentation and you will receive the answers as them. I think I, I think I will continue the presentation, and so it is just uh, maybe at, at the discussion at the end we will discuss this question, or uh, someone uh, they can like just uh, write their question in the chat box. So just as to summarize, yeah. you have you have an uh, obese white Caucasian uh, female with old standing diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease. She had a fracture seven years ago, but her DEXA BMD was uh, revealed that she has osteopenia, not osteoporosis. But her uh, physician started her on anti osteoporotic medication. So, however, the patient is osteopenic by DXMD, so the diagnosis of osteoporosis and the need to start anti osteoporotic medication were established by the clinical evidence of documented osteoporotic fracture. So, we all know that the definition of WHO definition of osteoporosis, the operational definition, if you have T score of minus 2.5 or less, you have osteoporosis, but also if you have a fragility fracture irrespective of bone mineral density, then you are osteoporotic. And moreover, if you have a very high 10-year uh, probability of fracture, you can be diagnosed as osteoporosis based on fracture score. Osteoporosis is characterized by low bone strength, which could be due to bone quantity and or bone quality. And our patient may have a bone quality rather than quantity problem, although there is a possibility that this DEXA might overestimate her BMD. Like Dr. Al Jabri mentioned in the first uh, presentation, that DEXA BMD can overestimate the uh, can underestimate the risk of fracture in patient with diabetes. And there are other available radiological tools which can help in examining her bone quantity and quality. So. Dr. Al Jabri talked about the trabecular bone score. So, trabecular bone score used gray level variation of the vertebrae to give us like a scoring system of the uh, trabecular separation of the vertebrae. And we have also the hip structural analysis, but it is less common or less commonly used than the TBS. And there is not, it was not constantly uh, demonstrated superiority than the DEXA BMD and the QTT. But it also uses a calculation to measure a femoral bone strength. So it does not only measure the bone quantity, but also give us uh, a hint about bone quality. So this patient was lucky that she did a QCT. She was uh, included in observational study back then, and her QCT was available. So you can here uh, see the QCT of her lumbar spine. And it revealed that L1, L2 T score was minus 2.9. So it was, it has osteoporosis in the QCT. Uh, however, her DEXA BMD revealed that she is only osteopenic. Uh, the T score by QCT at femoral neck was uh, quite similar uh, with the DEXA BMD. So, why was the DEXA scan in this patient can overestimate her bone quantity? Is it obesity? Is it diabetes? Is it coronary artery disease? Is it the mix of them? could be all of them. So we know that BMD is positively correlated with BMI. So if you have higher BMI, you can have higher BMD. And we know that patient with diabetes, they have um, higher BMD. And DEXA scan might underestimate their fracture risk. And also if the patient has coronary artery disease, there could be a confounding effect of the surrounding calcification. And I think this was the case here. So this patient has uh, a CAC score. So in the, with the QCT, they measured also the coronary artery calcification score, and they found that the intestinal score was more than 1,000. So she had a, uh, a coronary artery calcification. And this could be the cause why this patient, two years later, she had a BCI and she had a stent. So back to our patient. From the records, the patient DEXA BMD was stable over the seven years while she was maintained on oral bisphosphonate. The patient reported that she was a bit, uh, yeah, she was taking the bisphosphonate once per week, but sometimes she can miss a dose or two. 
the patient was not offered a bisphosphonate holiday, and today she presented with vertebral fracture, which are often painless and are not uncommon. So my second question is, how would you like to manage this patient? And again, you can answer you can uh, answer the question in the chat box. Our options were to start more potent anti-resorbative medication like zoldronic acid or donuzumab, or to start teriparatide or other osteoanabolic medication, or to continue on the same regimen as BMD and DEXA. BMD is stable over the seven years, or to order for bone turnover marker and other laboratory tests. So we ordered the bone turnover marker. You can see here the BAB, which has bone specific alkaline phosphatase and osteocalcin. They were within the normal range, maybe. The TRAF5B and the NTX as bone resorption markers, they were within the normal range for, um, or the TRAF was slightly elevated. Maybe the NTX was slightly elevated. The BTH was normal, serum calcium was normal, vitamin D was normal. She had a bit hypercalciuria, but I think if we corrected it with age, it would be uh, it would have normal calciuria. So, what is your decision? The BTM are inconclusive. So, what we can do? Can we start here on teriparatide or map as the patient may have low bone turnover due to the longer term use of bisphosphonate, or should we start here on more potent anti-resorbative medication? Give her Borrelia or Denosumab or to order bone biopsy. So in the light of the inconclusive result of the bone turnover marker and the new onset fracture while the patient was on bisphosphonate, the patient was offered the option of bone biopsy. She was lucky that this option was uh, available and she had agreed on bone biopsy. And this is just the table for labeling medication. So if you order a bone biopsy for your patient, you have to give him uh, which is called uh, a double tetracycline labeling or uh, democlocycline with tetracycline. As Dr. El Jabri uh, mentioned in her first presentation, that the fluorescence, yeah, I think I, I have also like a picture of the fluorescence of the fluorescence. So this labeling medication help us to determine the turnover status of the bone. And here is the bone biopsy re report. Uh, report. So two bone samples from the iliac crest. They were processed and cut without removal of the mineral. Uh, they used the Mason uh, golden art technique, aluminum stain, iron stain, and the congruent stain just for exclusion of aluminum, iron, and amide doses. And we found that the patient had a marked decrease in cortical sickness and the increase in cortical porosity. So uh, here is a cortical bone. So this patient has decreased cortical uh, volume. She has also a decrease in cancellous bone volume, which is a trabecular bone. So she has also a decrease uh, bone volume at trabecular side, and she has an increase in trabecular separation. Uh, there was no mineralization defect, so you can see that osteoid volume is in low normal range and the low osteoid uh, volume, and you, you, she had thin osteoid steam. She had a decrease in osteoblast bone inter uh, interface, which is means she had uh, low bone formation. She had also increased in osteoclast bone interface. I think it is mixed with high bone resorption. There is no pre-trabecular fibrosis, no evidence of bone marrow abnormality. And in the fluorescent light, you can see here that usually in the normal patient, you can see a double tetracycline labeling. But here, all you can see is a single label. So there was a marked decrease in trabecular surface with tetracycline labeling. The uptake is low. And you can see a single label here, only some few double label, not in this picture. And the distance between double label were not accessible. That means they are the patient to have clearly low bone turnover. So to summarize the diagnosis of the bone biopsy, the patient has osteoporosis with marked decrease in bone turnover and Market decrease in bone formation with a slightly increase in bone resorption. So, bone biopsy in patients with osteoporosis can be used to establish bone quality, to establish the degree of mineralization and the microarchitecture, to assess the bone turnover and to assess the mechanism of bone loss, and to analyze the treatment effect of bone structure. And I just wanted want to mention this study was Professor uh, Amr al Husseini. This study included patients with mild to moderate CKD, like our patient here. 
And the mean EGFR was like 44 milli per minute. And it included patient of EGFR up to 85. And we found that low bone turnover was very prevalent in those patients. And its prevalence increased in the early stages of CKD. So if the patient has CKD stage two, is more likely to have low bone turnover uh, than stage three. And the stage three more likely to have low bone turnover than stage four. And actually high bone turnover disease usually prevails in end stage kidney disease or in later stages of CKD. And as regards in patient to his, even patient to his primary osteoporosis, I think we published this uh, study this year for my PhD thesis. And we found that up to 44% of patients with primary osteoporosis, and these patients were treatment naive, they were they did not receive any, any anti-resorbative medication before the bone biopsy. We found that 44% of them has low bone turnover. So it is usual, it is could be prevalent even in patients with primary osteoporosis. And thank you. Thank you very much, Mendo, for this interesting piece. Uh, Professor Hanan, if you would like to uh, carry on with the discussion of the piece. I have a question uh, till uh, uh, Professor Hanan uh, will join. Um, so, Mendo, you mentioned okay, that 350 Abdul. milligram of urinary calcium excretion uh, uh, in 24 hours could be normal according to her age. Can you please uh, uh, give us uh, the correction factor or how can you, um, you know, adjust or modify this urinary calcium according to the patient age? I know the patient weight, the BMI, the gender. I'm not very uh, aware of the patient age. Can you please cl clarify? So I'm sorry if, if I mentioned like it is the patient age. So I don't think that there is a any adjustment for 24 urinary calcium for age, but it is adjusted for her weight. Her BMI is 35. So she had like, uh, she is very obese. And I think uh, for, uh, if you adjust for weight, if you, if the 24 hour urinary calcium is more than four milligram per uh, kilogram. So uh, you could, you could have high bar calciuria. Very good, very good. Thank, thank, you, so thank you so much. much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nandu. Mm -hmm. I uh, actually, okay. there is no... Dr. Hanan, uh, internet, I think it has interrupted. We cannot hear you well. Dr. Hanan, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, We cannot hear you very well, Dr. Hanan. There's a problem in the, I think, in the internet coverage. Sir Hanan. No. Can you hear Sir Hanan? Well, I couldn't hear her, her voice. No, I think I think she may have a problem with uh, internet. Okay, tell, tell Professor Hanan solve uh, this problem. Thank you very much, Mandu, for this interesting case. I think Same the message way. from 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 this case is that uh, the diagnosis of osteoporosis, especially in select in, in certain uh, categories of patient like our CTD, does not only rest on the the DEXA scan, uh, because as you mentioned, and the, whenever you proceed with your investigation, like uh, the bone turnover marker, like the uh, corrected uh, ES scan. Uh, it shows that it shows that it's not a high bone turnover only, and as we all know, uh, most most of the patients with the CKD nowadays are suffering from low low bone turnover. So it seems that it's a, it's a collection of pieces of the puzzle. We cannot rely only on one piece. We should proceed further with the investigation because in your case, I think anti anti resorbative for this lady is not the fairest choice. My question to you and to Amr as well and to Professor Asmaid Jabri, what about the, the, the trabecular bone scan? I mean, uh, how, how frequent we can do it? 
because as you all know, it, it carries a higher radiation risk compared to DEXA, compared to DEXA scan, in spite of higher sensitivity and uh, higher informative results. How, how frequent we can do it with, with a higher risk of radiation exposure? If Amri or Priscilla, do you want to handle this question or do you want me to handle so, it? Uh, whatever you like, Bruce. Um, go, yeah. go ahead. I know that you will handle it very well. <laughs> Thank you. So, yes, I agree that uh, QCT has uh, more radiation exposure than the DEXA scan. And up to now, uh, he's talking about the, the TBS. Dr. Ala, are you yeah. talking about the TBS or the QCT? Yeah. The TBS. So, the trabecular bone score is just uh, software. So there is no uh, added radiation to the patient. So you just do the uh, lumbar spine, DEXA BMD, and the machine is going to give you the trabecular bone score. So the trabecular bone score, as you, you can see in my screen now, so here is the DEXA scan, here is the normal, uh, the usual DEXA scan. These two patients, they have similar BMD by DEXA scan, but when they applied the algorithm or for TBS, so it is just an algorithm could be added to the DEXA machine. When they added this algorithm, so it is the same picture, the same patient. There is no added radiation. You can even uh, do it retrospectively. So if you have a DEXA machine uh, for uh, one patient like one year ago, and you have the, uh, the stored image in your machine, so you can retrograde, apply the TBS on them. So here is the TBS of 1.4, which is good, but here is the TBS of 1.1, which is very bad and they have similar BMD. So I'm not saying that trabecular bone score is a standard of care, but if the patient has a high DEXA BMD, if the patient is not osteoporotic by DEXA BMD, then the adding the trabecular bone score would be of a benefit. But if the patient is already osteoporotic, if the patient has already a bone qual quantity problem, so you can assume that the patient will need treatment. So I think the value of the trabecular bone score is that you can use it to uh, give that give, give medication or give treatment, uh, non-pharmacological and the pharmacological intervention to more patients. Okay, what about the uh, uh, bone marker turnover? You, you Professor Asma, have presented a long list of bone uh, marker turnover. If, we, if I ask you to select uh, the most practical and uh, uh, clinically uh, available bone marker for bone resorption and for bone formation. Can you advise one or two which can guide uh, you to a final diagnosis? Did you hear my question, Amanda? Dr. Asma, so you are asking me or Dr. Asma? I'm asking you if you, if you, uh, if you can okay. select one or two bone marker uh, just to be done on the clinical basis, because uh, as you and the Professor Asma, you have presented uh, a long list of uh, of bone uh, marker like So yes, so if you have a patient with CKD, uh, so these biomarkers they are excreted by the kidney. So if you have most of them, so if you have a patient with CKD. You can stick to bone-specific alkaline phosphatase as bone formation marker and the trap 5 b as bone resorption marker. And also you can use the intact B1 and B, not the total, the intact B1 and B as bone formation marker. But in general population, the National Osteoporosis Foundation, they uh, use the total B1 and B as bone formation marker and CTX, as bone resorption marker. So standard of care in general population is uh, B1 and B, the total B1 and B, and CTX. But if you have a patient with CKD, you can depend on BAP, trap 5 b and the intact B1 and B. Okay, and thank then, you very much. Of course, much. if the patient is CKD, you can oh, you, you should also do it the BTH. Okay, thank you very much, Mandor. Since we don't have uh, a question in the chat box, we should move to the next speaker. Okay, so next one should be uh, Dr. Amani. 
Dr. Yahud, can you please go ahead and introduce Dr. Amani Musa? So I'm searching for Dr. Yahud, but I could not find his name now. So Dr. Hanan, if she is around, she can introduce Dr. Amani Musa. If not, Dr. Alap Sabri or me can introduce, of course, Dr. Amani. She is a friend of all of us. So Dr. It's my mentor uh, and my professor. <laughs> so it is a great yeah. honor to introduce Dr. Amani. So Dr. Amani, professor of endocrinology and diabetes okay, from University. She's my mentor. She was my professor. And I, I'd like to present her to start her lecture now. So go ahead, Dr. Amin. Can you can you share your screen, uh, Professor Amani? Yes. Okay. Please go ahead, Dr. Amani, we cannot hear you. Now? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amr and Dr. Ale, for your uh, uh, support and for your uh, sharing us in uh, management and beginning this meeting. Um, and um, my talk today is about management of diabetic bone disease. Uh, many papers and clinical statements and guidelines focus on the management of diabetes and bone disease, but in separate. And type 1 and type 2 have high risk of fracture. However, there is no clear consensus about management of diabetic bone disease as one entity. My lecture will include, of course, a lot of drugs, and I have to say first that uh, I have nothing to declare, and there is no conflict of interest about preparing this lecture. For management of diabetic bone disease, it is considered a multitask job. First, the diabetic patient has to manage his diabetic state and control blood glucose in a way that maintain and uh, bone health. And at the same time, for if the patient needs an osteoporotic treatment, this treatment would have to be applied, but maintain also uh, the glucose and diabetic state. In addition to these factors, uh, other factors may interact like um, other, uh, non other non pharmacological uh, strategies or other medication taken by the diabetic patient that may interact uh, to have a role in the problem. Uh, these three aspects will be my objective in this lecture. As for, for other diabetic complication, control of hyperglycemia is the basis of control of this complication. Uh, exact diabetic control can result in enhancement of bone turnover and the reverse. If the patient is poorly controlled, the osteoclast and osteoplast activity will be imbalanced, then this impair bone formation. The standard of carrying diabetes in 2023, the ADA stated that. The average or the glycemic target is around to they have to be around seven or less in most patients, but give some a little bit flexibility for to less strict or more strict control to achieve the glycemic goal. If we apply this to our osteobro to our osteobotic patients, we will can say that less strict control may be uh, may be suitable for our seniors type 2 diabetic, old age, to prevent the attack of hypoglycemia, to avoid hypoglycemia, and more strict control may be favorable for younger patient type 1 to help them to reach the peak bone mass.
First, we'll try to look from the diabetic side. There are, there are of course, a lot of diabetic medication, but metformin is still in all the guidelines will be the first line of treatment with the non-pharmacologic management. Uh, without uh, talking about the pathogenesis in details, metformin can enhance bone formation and decrease bone extraction by facilitating in case of this AMB chemical. The progenitor stems in chimal cell can differentiate to either adipocyte or to osteoblast. This MPK molecule, which blocks block the differentiation of this progenitor cell to adipocyte and shift them towards the osteoblast formation. So it uh, gives positive response or is anabolic for bone and at the same time through inhibiting granule, it will inhibit osteoclast uh, genesis and inhibit bone reduction. Besides that, metformin has a role by improving insulin sensitivity and improving blood sugar, can also improve bone quality and through suppression of osteocalcin and osteoprotectin. But its action um, as regards reduction of the risk of fracture is still non-confirmed. In this beta analysis, uh, metformin was shown to not significantly associated with decreased risk of fracture. At, at the same time, none of the studies showed that metformin increased fracture risk. So it's considered a safe option for diabetic patients with bone disease. Sulfonylurea has not, hasn't a direct effect on bone, but an animal study found it to be associated with intensification of bone formation. But for fracture risk, um, the results are discrepant with you from study to study, but as a whole, it's considered in neutral about bone metabolism. This study shows that about 14% higher risk of fracture was found with sulfonylurea users compared to say, the, uh, other medication. It was equal, almost equal to uh, glitazone users, higher than metformin and lower than insulin. But interestingly to say that the hip fracture patient in this uh, study was, um, was nearly more common occur with patient if the hemoglobin NC, A1C was lower than 6.5. And this is, means that the association between high fracture and uh, sulfonyl urea users is almost all or nearly uh, due to a uh, hypoglycemia. These or glitazones are uh, do what is the reverse of what uh, metformin do. In contrast to metformin, they shift the uh, this mesenchymal cell to adipocyte differentiation rather than osteoplastic differentiation. And it's usually accused, it was accused to be to have many side effects, including harm to the bone and increasing risk of fracture and you gain weight. And it's, and, um, it's still as it, except for. There is possibility for a novel analog of uh, uh, glitazone, which is probably is still under trial, probably improve most of the impact um, that the old glitazone do for bone and may be uh, helpful in this. In creating this therapy, including GLB-1 receptor agonist and TB4 inhibitors, have direct effect in many tissue through the receptors that scattered all over the body. It has direct effect on bone and indirect effect. Indirectly, it can stimulate bone formation through control of blood glucose and through inhibition of osteoclast by stimulation of uh, calcitonin release from the thyroid gland. And it directly can stimulate osteoblast functioning and indirectly inhibit the osteoclast because osteoclast has no receptor for GLB but osteocyte has osteocyte secrete osteoclerostin, which is inhibited by creatine based therapy, and this uh, will suppress osteoclast the differentiation and function. So it appears to be towards to be positive for bone metabolism. DDB4 was uh, found in the study to have any change in the bone uh, turnover biomarker upon its use in naive patient. And in other study on ectinotides, you didn't alter the bone mineral density. Although there is a reduction in body, which you know that GLB receptor agonist and DDB4 inhibitor 
mainly GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, are uh, inducer for weight loss. And this weight loss also can affect the uh, bone metabolism and leads to decrease in bone mineral density. However, it, it, it is, um, maybe the, the, the positive effect can neutralize the impact of weight reduction on the bone metabolism. These two studies, the two meta-analysis done for DDB4 inhibitor and show that the total number of fracture was lower when DDB4 used for a diabetic patient. And this meta-analysis also show that GDB1 using is associated with lower risk of bone fracture and also maybe have a bone protective effect. SLGT2 uh, inhibitors are well known today by its renoprotective and the cardioprotective effect, but it is accused for its possibility of association with the high risk of fracture uh, due to the impairment of bone mineralization, which could be, uh, happen with its use. And at the same time, it is weight loss inducer, uh, but at the same time, it has a good effect because it is. It is uh, it's the uh, high impact on blood glucose lowering. Uh, so is the net result of this uh, interactions are uh, shown in different studies. First, in the canvas studies, they found is that there is 4% higher risk of fracture uh, found when using the canical closing. But in subsequent uh, studies, like the canvas R or Kittens study, they reported a higher risk of fracture was not confirmed in these studies. Also, a studies done for embagliflozin and the dibagliflozin didn't confirm any increase in risk of fracture associated with their use but after follow-up of about three and four years. And finally, this study Shows that the newly discovered, the newly used drugs like DDB4, GLB1, and sodium glucose transporter inhibitors are not associated with any increased risk of fracture when used in type 2 diabetic patients. For insulin, insulin therapy is known to be, uh, insulin generally is known to be anabolic for bone formation, and this is confirmed by the low peak bone mass uh, in diabetic patients, the type 1 because of uh, insulin deficiency. And insulin users usually have long history of diabetes and lots of diabetic complications, and uh, they will increase the risk of fracture associated with its use. And this study shows that the more risk of fracture with insulin users was found when even hemoglobin A1C was <laughs> indicates that most of the fracture with insulin user in insulin users could be attributed to the hypoglycemia. Now we have, can look from the other side of the impact of anti drugs in diabetes about, about efficacy and safety in diabetic patients. But before we ask this question, uh, we have another important question. When should we describe prescribe these antiosteoporotic drugs for diabetic patients? What is the indication for beginning antiosteoporotic treatment in diabetes? This algorithm may help. It is a nice algorithm. It indicates what is the indication for osteoporotic therapy. In diabetic patients, first, if diabetic patients experience any hip or vertebral fracture, it will go directly to osteoporosis treatment without looking for bone mineral density. And when doing bone mineral density, it would be, and they found it below, below minus two, it's also indication for osteoporotic treatment. At this, as you see, it is higher than the recommended for the other population, non-diabetic population. Also by the Olympic scan, if we find that there is morphometric vertebral fracture, morphometric means that it's discovered by uh, radiology. So if we have vertebral fracture, either a symptomatic vertebral fracture or morphometric vertebral fracture, it is also indication to begin osteoporotic treatment. And when assessing the risk of the patient, relying on 
فريكس سبورينج والتكستس كانينج والفريكس سبورينج اكتر موديفيكيشن الدكتور اسماء سيد اند ان بيشنت وذ ذا هاي ريسك فاكتورز فور فراكشر وين دوينج تكستس كانينج اند اند دوينج فريكس سبور اكتر ادجستمنت And the found is it is more than the complex specific intervention threshold. It is also indication for osteoporotic treatment. As we know, and osteoporotic treatment is um, classified into either an endoscopic patient which prevents bone reduction, <coughs> which stimulate bone formation. For anti-resorptive drugs, bisphosphonate was found to have a biotropic effect in the body. It is uh, found to, to have an effect as an anti-cancer and in, um, modifying uh, um, lipid metabolism and also in modifying carbohydrate metabolism. In some studies, it found to be induced reduction in the risk of diabetes up to 15%. Also in this meta-analysis, in this trial, it's fine to do decrease the fasting blood glucose level and the hemoglobin A1C in pre-diabetic postmenopausal women. But we here we have two, uh, two points to concern. First, diabetes is a condition of low, low bone turnover, as we hear from the last lectures. And when using anti-resorptive treatment generally, and specifically the, the IV preparations, which taken parenterally, it induced more low bone uh, turnover. And so we have to follow up the patient carefully to fear for, uh, because it will aggravate or, or increase the low bone over state in diabetic patient. Um, so it's mandatory to follow up the patient to decide whether to continue the treatment or to shift to another treatment and so on. Uh, the other point is using in CKD patient. Uh, CKD patient, it is eliminated through the kidney, so it is, uh, will retain in the body for, for, the, for years, maybe, especially the uh, IV preparation also. It will increase in the body, and uh, it is not suitable for patients with, uh, with last stage of kidney disease. Uh, uh, and must be, but if we use the oral preparation in my CKD patient, it is uh, okay for this. Uh, this you map, which is the other anti resorptive drugs, which act by binding to rank L receptor, rank L uh, molecules, have high affinity and safety profile, as it can be used in many patients, including patients with. Is the different stages of kidney disease. Uh, by blocking the rank L, L uh, uh, molecule, it could be predicted or expected to have an uh, effect on regarding insulin sensitivity or blood glucose. But studies found that there is no significant change in fasting blood glucose in diabetic or pre diabetic patients. Uh, it was shown to decrease the fracture. Uh, the risk of vertebral fracture and non-vertebral with more effect on vertebral fracture. Also, it has an effect on increasing el the muscle mass, uh, so decrease the sarcopenia associated with diabetic patients who may have an effect in decreasing the fracture of fall, uh, 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 risk of fall and the decreased risk of uh, fracture from fall due to increasing muscle strength and bulk. The selective estrogen receptor modulators, uh, uh, it is indicated in both monobotal female with vertebral fracture. And in the diabetes, there is no um, great change between diabetic and non-diabetic. In trials, it was found to be a similar effect. And in others, it, it was shown to have more effect uh, uh, in diabetic, uh, more than non-diabetic. But there is a query about its association with development of venous thromboembolic disease, but it's not confirmed in most of the studies. As diabetes is a low burn turnover state, so anabolic drugs is uh, considered 
a good option for treating these patients for high risk patients. The efficacy in a reduction of, uh, of uh, fracture of risk, fracture, uh, fracture risk reduction are more potent than anti agents. Their effect uh, on blood glucose is variable from study to study. In one study, it's shown to the, have impact on increasing blood glucose, but it's, uh, it's lower by chronic use, um, maybe after six months. In other studies, it's found to be neutral on blood glucose. And in this study, it was found to be on benefit on glucose on stasis and glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. For efficacy, it was found to be to increase the bone mineral density in all sites detected in this study. And uh, rather than the density, it was found to increase the trabecular bone scoring, especially with uh, apeloparatide compared to non user or compared to teraparatide. So it has impact on both bone density, bone quantity, and bone quality. Promsizumab is the first drug approved for uh, scalar stem uh, inhibition and the binding. And um, the studies about its use and efficacy and safety in diabetic patients are lacking. However, it is uh, usually associated with increased cardiovascular risk, which is, of course, increased in diabetic patients. So there's a question about its use uh, in diabetic patients. Calcitonin no longer considered a first line therapy for osteoporosis, and if used, it's recommended to use with adequate intake of calcium and the vitamin D for fear of hypoglycemia. Uh, now we go to the other perspective, as I mentioned, which should be considered during the management of diabetic bone disease patients. First, um, if the patient is losing weight, losing weight either by losing weight program in a losing weight program or doing a bariatric surgery, significant weight loss is associated with decreasing bone density, either through decreasing the skeletal load on the skeleton or by malnutrition, especially with malabsorbed surgery rather than uh, sleeve gastrectomy. So this and also have impact on bone turnover. It was found to increase bone turnover after the, uh, after surgery. So this patient must be followed up carefully by uh, and counteracting these effects on bone by exercise and by good nutrition. Uh, other drugs should be considered during the management of diabetic bone disease patients. Uh, these drugs are usually taken by diabetic patients. I will not talk too much about them, but they also, some of them have impact on uh, bone metabolism, either related to the dose or related to the type. So all the medications that diabetic patient take should be revised and the in intake of the minimally required doses of these drugs uh, to achieve the, uh, uh, the, the safety and the uh, side towards bone uh, metabolism. Here we reach a meeting point where uh, both uh, bone health and the diabetic health uh, can be achieved. And the, the non-pharmacological uh, strategies for both bone and the diabetes are the same, um, almost are the same. So the smoking and the good nutrition and are essential in initiating, before initiating any treatment, you know that the non-pharmacological treatment for diabetes is essential and we should start by, for, by it for any patient and also for osteoporotic patients is mandatory and they should start with, so, so it's beneficial for the post conditions. Type one and type two patients usually have vitamin D deficiency issue. So we have, have to ensure that the patient has adequate vitamin D and, and the calcium intake. Um, calcium intake and vitamin D could be given through natural sources and the natural sources is better. Uh, you can get enough, enough calcium through the diet and enough calcium, enough uh, vitamin D through diet and through some exposure, which is more safe for the patient. You have a 
skin receptors which can shut down and very smart to shut down when you take your requirement of vitamin D. It's unlike the, the, the exogenous vitamin D, which may cause vitamin D intoxication. As time exposed to take your required amount of vitamin D, depend on the part exposed and depend also on the season and the region. And this is the average for a, for a, a sunny region. Uh, and when the patient is uh, covering, uncovering um, about 25% uh, of his body, the head and the arms, it can uh, just 20 minutes is enough to get the required vitamin D. And if we're not uh, uh, sure that the patient can take his required amount of vitamin D and the calcium, should, you should give supplement as this case uh, to ensure mineral hemostasis because hypocalcemia also and vitamin D deficiency can induce parathyroid gland to be stimulated, and this will increase risk more and more for the bone in a diabetic patient. Exercise is very important both in diabetes and in bone. Uh, it increases a lot this, uh, the, the load on the bone and stimulates bone formation and inhibit bone resorption. All, all types of exercise are uh, important. Ranging from the low impact to weight bearing exercises, which could, uh, could be done by elderly patients just at home, um, like walking or stepping, or, or the more um, high impact uh, weight bearing exercise by the younger group, like uh, jumping and uh, running. It helped to increase the big bone mass uh, in adolescents and younger age. Uh, the final uh, uh, important point is to prevent the fall, either uh, by using fall preventive measures at house, like uh, being in the bathroom or lightning, and also prevent the falling related to diabetes by preventing or avoiding hypoglycemia, treating diabetic uh, retinopathy, diabetic uh, neuropathy, to assure good vision and a balance for the patient to prevent him from falling. To conclude, despite the growing evidence that patients with type 1 type 2 suffer from an increased fracture risk, there is still no clear consensus on how to manage diabetic bone disease. No pharmacological treatment is a non-pharmacological treatment is a common path for this condition. No best drug fit for all management plan should be tailored according to each diabetic patient to get maximum benefit with minimal risk. Thank you for listening and I'm um, um, this is Thanks, Dr. Amani. Thank you, uh, At first, I thank Dr. Hamra and Dr. Mandoh about the organization of this important meeting. Uh, I am. I. I think. There is a problem in the hacker uh, at first of uh, before uh, Dr. Amani talked. Retrospectively, I introduce, uh, I pleasure to introduce Dr. Amani again. Amani Thank Musa you. is <laughs> consultant of endocrinology at Mansoura <coughs> University uh, Man Medical Specialist Hospital and the professor of endocrinology and the medicine. Uh, and the head of uh, metabolic bone disease clinic uh, in uh, our hospital, medical specialist hospital at Manzur University. Uh, I think if there is any question for, from the uh, audience. We just have a quick question, uh, Dr. Yogurt, if you allow me. Yes. So I. Um, okay. Yeah. Dr. Amani, you, you mentioned that sulfonyl urea has 14% uh, high risk uh, of uh, uh, fractures. I was aware of the TZ, TZD is very bad for the bone, even, uh, you know, it's, um, there is a recommendation not to start it in patients with high risk of uh, fracture or patients with osteoporosis. But if I understand you correctly, did you mention that sulfonyl urea might have the same risk as TZDs in uh, inducing bone loss and increasing risk of fracture. Can you please clarify on that? Yes, and this study was found to have the same risk, but they attribute the high risk to 
due to occurrence of hypoglycemia, mainly. Does sulfonylurea induce more hypoglycemia compared to other anti-diabetic medications? <coughs> Maybe attributed to the dose in this study. I don't know. The there is, there is no, Dr. Ahmed, there is no uh, uh, effect of uh, sulfonylurea on the bone at all. There's the risk of hypoglycemia and risk of fall only, uh, like insulin. But there is no uh, direct effect on the bone metabolism between sulfonylurea and bone. But the bioglitazone, there is no, there is uh, uh, already a definite uh, effect on the uh, bone mineralization uh, in uh, bioglitazone or TZD. But the sulfonylurea is no, no effect on the bone metabolism. Why did it induce more falls? Uh, why did it induce more hypoglycemic uh, episodes compared to other? Is it common this to is, see that? The this is, 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 the well -known, uh, is the well known. Uh, the well known complication for use, uh, during using sulfonylurea is it's in the hypoglycemia and users. The, the the most potent hypoglycemic medication from anti-diabetic uh, drugs is insulin and sulfonylurea. Sulfonylurea is insulin secreted group. But the other medication is, uh, is anti-hyperglycemic medication, like TZDs or uh, SLATE 2 or whatever the drug is for me. But the sulfonylurea is potent and hypoglycemic medication and also the insulin. Very good. So do you try to avoid giving sulfonylurea for patients with recurrent episodes of hyperglycemia? Yes. yes, okay. Very good, very good. Thank you so much for this comment. Well, we have a question in the, in the chat, I think, from Dr. Khaled Wafi, if you, if you want to take it. On the chat? He's asking about the yes. vitamin D replacement, the level vitamin that D. we replace the vitamin uh, D. Yeah, and he said that should we apply TBS for all diabetic patients or only those with history of fracture? And when we should start the... Uh, and when you should start that? Start what? So his question is, should we apply TBS for all diabetic patients or only those with history of fracture? And when we should start that? I think starting uh, applying TBS maybe. Yes, can I answer? Okay, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, TBS is, uh, application is not an, uh, um, a hard thing. It's, it's, it's so easy. It is just a uh, software done with while doing DEXA scanning. It's not it's, uh, anything. And if the machine is prepared to do assessing the uh, TBS, so it would be uh, shown in the result of DEXA scanning as well. So if it is available in the machine, it's better, of course, it would be done with diabetic patients. It give idea about the bone microarchitecture, so it give idea about the bone quality, which is impaired in diabetic patients. I would take advantage on, on this meeting, uh, Dr. Amani, and uh, uh, highly encourage everyone, when you order DEXA scan and you get the report of the DEXA scan and you don't see the TB as the trabecular bone score, as one of uh, the uh, elements in the report, you talk to the radiology, uh, you know, uh, and talk, tell him that we need the TBS. Because the problem uh, is that will be with the availability because it's available software, on all the many, it's a software. If, if the radiologist is getting a lot of calls from us that we really need the TBS, I think he will apply it. It's just the yeah. money he need to to buy. It. It's available. It's highly available. It's very popular. In America, it's a standard of care. Uh, it should be a standard of care everywhere. It's just a software. It's not going to, uh, you know, induce yeah. any harm. We just need to apply it. And maybe the radiologist, if he doesn't, or if he doesn't get, you know, communication with us, clarifying the importance of the TBS, he will not be eager to, you know, buy it with money. I don't know how much it costs, but I think if we talk to them, they might be interested in getting it. I totally agree with you, Dr. Trump. Thank you so much. Let's move because of the sake of the time. Thank you, Dr. Yaoud. Dr. Hanan, uh, would you like to introduce Dr. Rushdie? If Dr. Hanan was Dr. asked. Hanan, uh, Dr. Hanan, Dr. Hanan Sutuhi. 
If not, uh, I think uh, Dr. Yaud can introduce Dr. Rushdie. Uh, I believe to introduce. Uh... I cannot find Dr. Hanan, so okay. you can go on. Oh, sorry. Okay. Dr. Rushdie, is it ready? Yes, I'm ready for uh, Hamdu. I pleasure to introduce Dr. Mohamed Rushdi, the lectures of endocrinology uh, at the Mansour University Hospital, Medical Specialist Hospital, uh, one of uh, member, uh, one of the active member of uh, our uh, department. Uh, Dr. Rushdi will uh, uh, present a case scenario. Uh, Dr. Rushdi. Much thanks, my brother, Dr. Mohamed Yaoud. I'm going to to present my case scenario today. I have a patient, 22 years old female, single student with regular menstruation. She was diabetic since eight years ago, and she was on basal bolus insulin regimen. However, uh, although there was uh, no documented macrovascular complication, but neuropathy was there with recurrent attacks of hypo and hyperglycemia, and she complained of a swollen hot and red left foot. How uh, with no history of trauma, but history of recurrent fragility fracture. On examination, we found that the uh, unilateral swollen not tender left foot with erysema with higher temperature for the left foot with, uh, measuring 34 degree, uh, comparable to the right one, which was which was measuring 30 degree only. By the radiological uh, evaluation, the X-ray showed no fracture line, no uh, any abnormality. And by the ultrasound, superficial ultrasound, the duplex, there was no affection of the soft tissue and no documented DVT. However, the X-ray scan was, document was documenting that there was osteoporosis, most likely secondary osteoporosis, and was more prevalent than the distal one third of the radius with a Z score minus 3.3. According to the laboratory investigation, our patient showed microcytic hypochromic anemia. Regarding the biochemistry, the inflammatory marker was negative. Her creatinine was 1.1 milligram per deciliter. Her liver function was good with urine album creatinine ratio within the normal range. Her calcium panel showed hypocalcemia with secondary hyperparathyroidism and the low vitamin D level. And her self monitoring for blood glucose showed scheme range of blood glucose ranging from 30 to 40. 5 milligram, 50, 40, 40, 50 milligram, 450 milligram per deciliter, known as brittle diabetes, and A1C was 9.5%. To more proceed, so we have managed our case. We have four key issues. The first one, we have the swollen red and left foot without evidence of infection, but neuropathy. The second one is a microcytic hypochromic anemia and the search of hypocalcemia, vitamin D deficiency, and a history of fragility fracture. And the last one is a brittle diabetes. For the first issue, we proceed to the MRI, which revealed we have a case of acute Charcot, which is a complication of the diabetes related even to the neuropathy. And the second issue for the microcytic hypochromic anemia, we have proceed to uh, upper GI endoscopy, and this upper GI endoscopy will have a biopsy from the first part of the duodenum, which revealed a pathology uh, indicating it's a case of celiac disease. And celiac disease uh, already solved the other two issues, which can uh, indicate the malabsorption, so causing hypocalcemia, vitamin D deficiency, hysterofragile defracture, and as well, brittle diabetes, and it is many times has been reported as a celiac disease as a cause of anemia and the brittle diabetes in type 1 uh, diabetic patient. So our diagnosis included brittle type 1 diabetic patient with acute charcoal, celiac disease and absorption, and osteoporosis. Acute charcoal, as I said, it is one of the complications. It's presented in two phases. One is the acute stage, and the second one is the chronic one chronic stage. In the acute stage, there is no abnormality in the, in the X-ray, but abnormality only in the MRI. Why is the chronic stage? There is destruction even in the joint with uh, disorganization of the joint uh, uh, spaces and uh, as well as destruction of the bone. If it is not treated, it will be received to the orthopedic fixation. If it is not treated more and more, it can lead to amputation. So please do not delay. Progression of disease waits for no one. Acute charcoal 
has many theories uh, in its pathophysiology. One of its important theory is the neurotraumatic inflammatory pathway, including that we have neuropathy and minor trauma repeatedly in diabetic patient because of the loss which have been reported in the previous lectures. Then we have the inflammatory marker, markers such as tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin one beta, which activates the rank rankle pathway and ending by in stimulation of the osteoclast precursors to increase the osteoclast formation and decrease the osteoporotic which protect against the bone remodeling. So the question is, is it osteoporosis is a local disease just affecting the foot of the diabetic patient or it is a systemic disease sharing the same physiology of the osteoporosis? Many uh, uh, review articles have been uh, published showing that uh, Charcot seropathy could be a lead sequel of the osteoporosis uh, depending on the sharing the same mechanism. This was published in the, uh, by the end of the last surgery, century while in 2018 uh, years old uh, the journal of diabetes and its complication showed that BMT, a bone mineral density showed by DEXA scan in a co case control study showed no significant effect even during the acute stage and even on following the patient for about 8.5 years with no effect on the hip or even on the foot. Even the trapecular bone score, which was recommended by our staff today, even using this and during the same duration showed also no effect. However, this paper, which was published in August 26, 2021 uh, in diabetes care, and what was the wide national wide uh, study uh, show literature review showed that we have uh, osteoporotic fracture more and more after the diagnosis of acute charcoal. But some claim that could be due to many complications associated with the pathophysiology of the acute charcoal as a part of the neuropathy, affection of the diabetic retinopathy, an association of many medications used with uh, uh, increasing the risk of the hypoglycemia. So how to treat? Actually, we have recommended our patient to be treated according to the guidelines published. Uh, so our patient should have had uh, total contact, contact cost while other can uh, talk about what about the pathway, which can be used as a as as a model for treatment uh, using the rank rankle uh, pathway to be blocked using especially the dinuzumab or prodia. Uh, in many uh, studies, have shown some effect, but it's still it's still not recommended. Uh, however, bisphosphonate showed uh, no uh, major effect in uh, pathophysiology or the treatment. And all of these treatments can be used only during the acute stage of the charcoal, not recommended in the chronic stage of the charcoal. And we're still waiting for the International Working Group of Diabetic Food to, be pub to publish its guidelines next, uh, during this month, uh, during its conference, which will be held in Netherlands. We're still waiting for the new guidelines. Again, we have the second part of the diagnosis, which is a celiac disease causing malabsorption and osteoporosis. Celiac disease is autoimmune disorder, is uh, associated with diabetes, and the patient with diabetic with diabetes should be screened for celiac disease on occasion, even during diagnosis and after one year and five years. And uh, it is usual, usually presented with gastrointestinal symptoms, such as diarrhea, bloating, chronic abdominal pain. However, celiac disease only present with only osteoporosis and even with a fracture. To diagnose celiac disease, we have at least four or five, or four, three or four, if GL, HL agent type is not confirmed, according to the following typical symptoms, as I have, I have mentioned, positivity of serum celiac disease, immunoglobulin A, HLA, DQT, or celiac entropy at small intestinal biopsy and the response to gluten-free diet. What's important about celiac disease is the osteoporosis. Uh, I do think all of you know that osteoporosis could cause only uh, uh, celiac disease could cause only osteoporosis so its uh, effect on the intestinal uh, malabsorption of the calcium and the vitamin. However, there is another way, including production of the cytokines again, interleukin one, interleukin six, and the tumor necrosis factor alpha, increasing the osteoclastic activity, increasing the bone resorption, and decreasing the bone mass. How to manage celiac disease? Celiac disease as a diagnosis. Here, DEXA scan is beneficial. 
and evaluation should be done at the diagnosis, especially if the patient presented with a malabsorption science. If the patient is not presenting with a science of malabsorption, just evaluate a BMD and diagnosis if the patient is at higher risk, such as your patient uh, have a old age, menopausal, a history of regenerative fracture, like our patient, then you should start with gluten-free diet and no recommendation to start here with a medical therapy, except after two years interval of starting the gluten-free diet, which is the main treatment line in the celiac disease management-induced osteoporosis. So strict to gluten-free diet seems to be more effective in treatment and then stop to uh, get osteo osteoporotic medication in the initial step of the management of patient uh, having osteoporosis and to do celiac disease. However, if there is no response after two years, you can add on anti-resorbative medication, a therapy here can be used uh, in treatment of the osteoporosis or tiriparal type. So remember, diagnose before you prescribe. And not the treatment is always a medication, but also can be another way to diagnose and can another way to prescribe than other the medication. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shrojdi. I feel Dr. Am. Yes, uh, very, very interesting uh, case. Um, so I just have a quick question. So is there is any association between the charcoal joint and the sclerostin level of the bone turnover, low or high? Do you see a high sclerostin level in this patient? Does it suppress the bone formation? Is there is a rule of uh, romosozumab? as uh, uh, osteoanabolic in this patient as monoclonal antibody against sclerostin? According to the bone turnover marker, yes, there is increasing the bone turnover marker, uh, but it was no, not so significant to be, it is still a study, uh, observational, not uh, uh, of high evidence uh, to be used in diagnosis even or to monitor the therapeutic effect. According to the treatment, I do think uh, uh, Dinozumab is more bitter than Rumozumab uh, because it targets the pathway involving in the pathophysiology of the uh, acute charcoal. And, uh, uh, and uh, I do think even trials have been made according to the tiribaratitide as anabolic to be used as well uh, in treatment. But I do not uh, think Rumozumab has been used. I, I, I think it will, uh, good question. I think it will need more further research. In association with the sclerostin, higher sclerostin level for these patients? Uh, actually, I don't know. I have not read something about it. Thank you so much for uh, the answers. Uh, for the Thank sake you. of the time, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Riot, uh, if you allow me just uh, to uh, go ahead and introduce Dr. Sally to give the rationale yes. and the, um, for the answers and the justification for the best answer we have for the quiz. Yeah. Can you introduce Dr. Sally, uh, Dr. Yaud? Tell us your Dr. Sally is a, a lecturer of uh, endocrinology at uh, Mansoura University Hospital, Medical Specialized Hospital. Dr. Sally Samih, and the consultant of endocrinology. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Hello, everybody. Are you ready for quiz answers? We are. Regarding diabetic osteopathy, which of the following statement is true? The answer is B, the higher fracture risk described in type 2 diabetes despite the elevated mean values and T-scores is due to an impaired bone quality. 
My next question, Mrs. R, 55 years old, the nurse with type 2 diabetes of six years duration, inquiring about decreased bone density in diabetes. Regarding bone mineral density in diabetic patients, is the following statement is true? The answer is B. Only most of the most women with type 1 diabetes has a lower bone mineral density than that of the normal population during the same period after adjustment of age and BMI. Mrs. A, 60 years old, osteoporotic on alantronate, 70 mg weekly, and diabetic on oral treatment for the last three years, with acceptable control of diabetes, visited our patient clinic for follow-up. What would your target on globin A1C be in the management of type 2 diabetes patients at risk of fragility fracture in the light of this case? The answer is D. According to American Diabetic Association guidelines, individualized hemoglobin A1C target to balance the need for good glycemic control for reduction of type 2 diabetes complications and the risk of hypoglycemia on treatment. Next question, which of, this, which of these anti-osteoporotic drugs can be used in the treatment of osteoporosis in suitable type 2 diabetes patients? Bisphosphonates, denizumab, raloxifen, or tribatide? The answer is A. There are no type 2 diabetes specific approved drug for osteoporosis treatment till now. Regarding hyperglycemic control, is hyperglycemic control is the base of uh, diabetic bone disease treatment. Regarding anti-diabetic treatment, which of, which of the following is that's correct? The answer is D. Cyazolidinia dione causes increase in the adipogenic differentiation of bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells and the inhibition of the osteogenic differentiation. Increasing the bone marrow fat by diverting conversion of mesenchymal stem cells into adipocyte rather than osteoblast yeah, means, means that cyazolidine dione is a bad choice for diabetic patients with osteoporosis. Thank you for listening. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sally, uh, for giving these answers. I think. Uh, we are um, by the end of uh, our webinar today. I think. Uh, uh, Dr. Amir, would you like to share the responses? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I think all of us have learned a lot and uh, will surprise you with your responses. Um, Dr. Hanan is going to share with us the okay, Google so we, response. Okay, we got. We got uh, 10 responses this for this quiz. Uh, I'm very proud of your answers and I'm proud of my questions. So uh, I just shared this to, uh, to, to clarify about one question, which is uh, equalized between the normal and the right answer and wrong answer. So regarding uh, Mrs. R, 55-year-old nurse of type 2 diabetes, six-year duration, inquiring about her de decreasing bone density in diabetes. So there, was two, there, were, there were two answers equally. Uh, usually in early stage of type 2 diabetes, the bone mineral density in re is reduced in type 2 diabetes due to insulin resistance, and this is wrong answer. Because in early stage of type 2 diabetes, we have an increased bone mineral density due to the effect of insulin resistance. It is, uh, they studied already the relation between insulin and IGF-1 and the bone mineral density. Uh, they found it already increased, highly increased in the start of diabetes type 2. The right answer or correct answer here only postmenopausal women with type 1 diabetes have a lower bone mineral density and with the same uh, with the same age and uh, BMI, people of the same category. So this is the very the question which has a controversy in it. The other questions, the right answer for which of an anti osteoporotic drug can be used as a treatment for osteoporosis in suitable type two diabetes. Uh, it, the right answer was about sixty six point seven percent. Is there is no special uh, treatment or approved drug for type two diabetes. The hyperglycemic control. Which of the uh, the right answer was about 80%. Also, uh, the last question, 
This is a 60% osteoporotic on aldronate. Also, right answer was about 44.4%. Uh, uh, the, the very first question, the right answer was about 50%. And thank you for your responses and for your elegant share. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hanan, for sharing with us the responses. I think we, we are, by the end of our meeting, I really appreciate and thank uh, everyone for his or her contribution. This is uh, an amazing uh, effort between nephrology and endocrinology. And this, uh, this should be the way we work. We work as a team, multidisciplinary team, and we you know, play together. There is no one can play uh, or score by him or herself. We have to work together in a symphony and harmony. And I see this is uh, happening uh, between uh, the two divisions right now. I will uh, let Dr. Sabri and Dr. Yaout uh, to give uh, final um, statements about the meeting. And if they want to uh, um, you know, give us any suggestions or recommendations for further contributions and meetings. Thanks, Dr. Amr about, and Dr. Mandor about this uh, elegant uh, meeting. I think it's better to discuss in the next uh, meeting, inshallah, uh, uh, about the osteoporosis uh, uh, in CKD patients. Absolutely. We'll be glad to do that. So, inshallah. Thank Shukran you, Dr. Amr. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Dr. Sabri, please mute uh, yourself, Dr. Sabri. Unmute yourself. You're still muted, Dr. Sabri. Yeah, go ahead. Here we go. Here we go. No, you can hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Professor Amr Hussaini, Professor Hanna Sohi, Professor uh, uh, Amani, actually. And as you all know, as a nephrologist, when, whenever we did a meeting, we are talking to ourselves. We are just seeing one side of the coin. But actually for this meeting, we discovered that we can get benefits from discussion between uh, endocrinologists, nephrologists, and we can learn even from the uh, junior doctors. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, inshallah, we will try to do our best to maintain that to run a, a next webinar, maybe within two or three months. This depends on the moderator themselves. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank the heroes uh, beyond the scene. I mean, the young generation, Mandouh, Dr. Mohammed Rajdi, uh, Dr. Hanan, all of them actually, uh, uh, actually they, they completely and participate to the success of this meeting. Uh, for saying goodbye, we would like to thank them all and we would like to thank the audience as well for this contribution. Hopefully, we can see you in short time. Thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, you will receive a feedback form. Please give us uh, your feedback so we can improve uh, uh, our performance and work on our deficiency. And uh, have a good night, everyone. And see you all again in the next uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you.